do 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 merry go merry go merry go round do 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 me and you can go merry go round it's very easy just go up and down come on come on let's merry go merry go merry go round do 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 merry go merry go merry go round People say you often come to resemble your pets, and I think that's true. For the last three years, my pet has been Brad Pitt, and I must say the resemblance is uncanny. It's great being human, but we have to remember that we can learn a lot from the animal, um, um... Kingdom! Kingdom, thank you. I like to watch a lot of wildlife documentaries in the hope that I might learn something. After all, it's a jungle out there if you live in Brazil or Rwanda somewhere. Recently I saw a film about gazelles. Now gazelles are hunted by wild dogs. What happens when the dogs move in for the kill is that the gazelles all start to leap up and down with great vigour. It's their way of saying to the dogs that they are fit and healthy and therefore will be difficult to catch. And what the dogs do is they attack the lowest leaper. Now recently I was walking through the Latin quarter of Aylesbury when I came upon a rough gang beating up a lamppost. Some sixth sense told me that I was in trouble when I heard them yell, Let's kill Alexis Sale! As they ran towards me I found I couldn't move because of a wall of sweat. Suddenly I remembered the programme about gazelles and I started leaping. And I threw in some healthy whooping as well. The strategy seemed to work. The gang were wary and confused. Then they beat the shit out of me. After about ten minutes, they left me lying in the gutter with a lot of blood on the wrong side of my skin. Luckily, though, I'd also seen a documentary on snakes, so I was able to slither to the nearest hospital. My parents were both communists and they told me that religion was the opium of the people, which made opium a bit of a surprise when I tried it. When you're political, you think you know the answer to all the world's problems. But nowadays, I'm not so sure. Now, when people ask me questions of heavy social issues, I usually reply, <laughs> which is as true today as it's ever been. Another question people ask me is, Alexi, is that your real name? And I reply... Yeah. Another question people ask me is, do you write your hilarious comedy using a word processor? And I say no, I use a pen and I write on ruled paper. The paper is ruled by an evil dictator called Zorb who uses mind control to keep down his subjects. <laughs> The only political involvement I have now is that I'm a member of Amnesty International, a human rights group. Recently I went to the United States on a delegation for Amnesty. We were looking into the treatment of Native Americans, what used to be called Red Indians. Of course, Native Americans don't call themselves Native Americans. They simply call themselves the people. The people. Apart from some tribes who call themselves the Sunday Mirror. One of the things we've imported from the States that I really disagree with is graffiti, writing graffiti on walls. Now, I must admit, when I was younger, I did write some graffiti, but it was very early days, and also I didn't quite have the hang of it. Because what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to, like, spray your tag, like, Snot69 or Wizzo, you know. But what I used to spray was Alexi Sale, Five Valley Road, Anfield, Liverpool 4. So it was really easy for the police to arrest me. Well, it was relatively easy for the police to arrest me. First of all, they tried to arrest a black man at 5 Mally Road. Then they tried to arrest an Irishman at 5 Scally Road. Finally, they arrested me. You're sitting there at home and you're thinking, this show's completely useless and I'm totally crap. Remember, I've got some of your money. You haven't got any of mine.
If you really want to know about the world, it's all here on the magazine rack. Every interest is catered for. For example, housing is a very popular subject, isn't it? And here you have the very imaginatively titled Homes, which is about homes. Then you have Homes and Gardens, which is about homes and gardens. Homes and Antiques, which is about homes and antiques. And Homes and Crafts, which is about homes and UFO sightings. But I actually think the homeless should have their own magazines as well, and maybe Shelter could do them. You know, you could have Homeless and Gardenless, Doorway and Blanket, and Ratty Dog and Scab. There's an amazing range of specialist magazines. There's even a magazine called You. If that isn't targeted marketing gone mad, I don't know what is. And here we have tattooing magazines. But you have to be really careful if you're reading these in the bath, because if the print comes off on your arms, you'll never get it off. And here's a bodybuilding magazine. Hmm, thought it'd be heavier. Here, they keep the weapons magazines. And this is where they have the puzzle magazines. Now, to me, really, the only puzzle is why anybody bloody buys them. Here we are. Now it's a jigsaw. Hours of fun. Of course, magazines on their own aren't enough anymore. Now they have to offer all kinds of free gifts. Music mags with free cassettes and CDs. Golf magazines with free tees, so you can change words that you don't like. And true crime, which comes with a free theft. Best. That's a bit optimistic, isn't it? I think they should be sued under the Trades Descriptions Act. OK. That's more like it. A bit of honesty in publishing. And where would any magazine shop be without the top shelf? There's... Basketball and Basketballers. There's Unadventurous Mountaineer. There's Wee Incorporating Boing, the trampoline magazine. And there's Tall Boy, the gay sex magazine incorporating furniture. Please do not read the magazines in the shop. If you want to read it, buy it. I hate signs like this, so what I like to do is... <clears throat> Excuse me, have you read the sign? No, I can't read. a big fan of Victorian literature. No, I'm not. But, um, you know, Victorian novels, a lot of them were actually quite different when they started out. Yeah, for example, Conan Doyle's novel was originally called The Duck of the Baskervilles. Quack, 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 quack. Oh, what a frightening giant duck. Robert Louis Stevenson's novel of demonic possession was originally called Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Monkhouse. And, of course, there was Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Sooties. <laughs> Literature also shows us how times have changed. For instance, in the Sherlock Holmes novels, Sherlock Holmes was often helped out by the Baker Street Irregulars. These were a group of very young boys and girls who did little jobs for a cocaine addict who lived with another man. Wouldn't happen these days, would it? Social services would be straight round. Also, it could be hard being a novelist as well. You know, Emily Bronte, because she was so poor, when she was 18, she had to become a governess. I mean, she's a bit young to be running a prison. Oscar Wilde's supposed to be our greatest wit and raconteur, isn't he? He's got 59 entries in the Oxford Book of Quotations. However, he had a working life for 26 years, right? So that means, simple mathematics tells us, that Oscar Wilde only said something worth hearing on average once every six months. So, the next time you're less than sparkling at a dinner party, remember, even our greatest wits had their off days. <laughs> <laughs> But the thing I cannot abide is people talking about me behind my back. It will not do, I cannot have it. I'm sure Mr. Wilde has something to say on the subject of being talked about. Eh? Do I? Yes, Mr. Wilde. You always long to hear your opinion. Right. Um, well... There's only one thing worse than being talked about. Yes? And that's... Not being able to get it up when you're pissed and she's gagging for it. <laughs> <laughs> you said he was witty. He normally is. Oh.
tell me, Mr. Wilde, what was that tremendously witty thing you said only the other week? It concerned the occasion when you were traveling to America, and the customs officer asked, do you have anything to declare? Do tell it to us, Oscar. No, I don't think I should. Oscar, tell it. Well, all right. <laughs> the customs officer said to me, do you have anything to declare? And I said, quick as a flash, declare. I haven't declared yet. You see, how can I declare a thing when I haven't declared it yet at all? The thing, it's not been declared. Mm. Oh, no, here's a good one, here's a good one. Um, to lose one parent may be considered a misfortune, but to lose the charity shield to the Arsenal, 3 nil. I ask you, 3 nil. that's a f***ing tragedy. <laughs> it needs work. Hi. I'm the real Alexis Sale. Writer, broadcaster, man. You know, a while ago, I was abducted by aliens. <laughs> yeah. I guess, for most people, it'd be a really horrible, unpleasant experience, you know. But for me, you see, being a celebrity, I was abducted business class. <laughs> Yeah, an ethereal light beamed down from the sky, and I was whisked up into the mothership past like queues of people waiting to be abducted into the economy section. I suppose being abducted by aliens can be a daunting experience if it hasn't happened to you before, but you know, they tried to make us comfortable in business class. We had a choice of three newspapers, the Beta Gamma Enquirer, the Argle Fargle Independent, or Loot. The hostesses, yeah, kind of sexy, you know. Well, as sexy as a three-four high single-cell monoculture ever gets. <gasps> Movies, yeah, a bit of a disappointment, really. Um, they're still showing the Shawshank Redemption. Okay, so why were we there? Experiments, right? We had to take part in experiments. I had to grow some kind of watercress on blossom paper. Other people had to burn holes in a piece of paper with a magnifying glass. Chul Dando was just having the most terrible trouble with their hand foul. Uh, but mind you, judging from the blood-curdling screams coming from back there in the economy section, I think there the experiments were just a teensy-weensy bit more nasty. They really were ever so sweet, you know. I mean, none of us came away empty-handed. I got this lovely leatherette washing bag. Mind you, I've still got no bloody idea what this is for. <laughs> so, all in all, I'd have to say that it was, yeah, a lovely experience, you know. Sure, by the end of it, my ankles had swollen up to the size of pumpkins. <laughs> I guess the jet lag lasted like two and a half years. But, I think I'd be abducted by them again, sure. And best of all, I got like billions of air miles. There's an old saying which goes something like, there's only one thing worse than not getting what you want, and that's getting what you want. And I can certainly go along with that. Christ knows what I thought I was gonna do with a live crocodile in a bucket. I've really got to get a grip, though. I've decided to completely turn my life around. Instead of being unhappy and depressed, I'm going to be depressed and unhappy. I suppose I'm still searching for meaning in life. Some choose to believe that we are watched over by creatures from other planets. And certainly tales of alien abduction are now so common that they're accepted as articles in the Observer Travel Supplement. Others choose to believe in the spirit world. And it's certainly true, once I lived in a house that every few months or so was suddenly filled with flying white feathers, hissing, and bits of corn. Yes, it was possessed by polter geese. My search for meaning in life led me to consider becoming a Buddhist. Buddhists meditate, don't they? I suppose it's better than sitting around the house doing nothing. The other thing that Buddhists do is chant. So there I was down the ashram going, you're going home in a f***ing ambulance. Coming over here if you think you're hard enough. Um. 
Buddhists also believe in reincarnation. With my luck, I'd probably come back as me. What's that feeling you get when you know you go through something and then you find yourself going through it again? Oh, I know, being up in court. Yeah. After a while, I abandoned Buddhism and I decided to become a Christian. Now, fundamentalist Christians believe that God is everywhere. Well, I reckon if God is everywhere, he must be a scouser. Because scousers are bleeding everywhere, aren't they? Like you're halfway up the Hindu Kush and you hear this voice going, All right, mate, you a scouser, mate. Hey, get any spare chains, mate. Got any spare chains? I want to buy myself a scabby dog on a string, mate. All right, mate. If Jesus loves me, how come he never phones? Hmm. Fundamentalist Christians also believe in faith healing, the power of faith to heal all illnesses. Now, there's an American faith healer who comes over to London every year called Maurice Chirula. And I went to see him at Ailes Court recently and it was amazing. Eight people went down to the front in wheelchairs and came back without them. He hadn't cured them or anything, he just nicked their bleeding wheelchairs. <laughs> <laughs> I was in this pub the other day, right, and this bloke came up to me and he said, Hello, I'm your worst nightmare. And I said, what? You're a giant elephant in a bathing costume standing on the edge of a swimming pool. Then the elephant dives into the swimming pool and the swimming pool is full of puppies. And each of the puppies has the face of a Sky newsreader. Then all the puppies coalesce into one giant British Midland stewardess. And she says in a very severe accent, You've wet the seat again, Mr. Sale. No more hot towels for you. No more hot towels for you. He said, no, I'm just a fan who wants to tell you a joke. But I can see you're a much sadder individual than I thought. Anyway, he told me the joke, and it was quite short and quite good. Agrophobic skinhead, or you, inside! <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we're separated from my wife. I sleep in my jacket, I'm on pills from my nerves, you know, for... My former wife, Helen, you know, she was actually a bit of a health freak, actually. She was really into that colonic irrigation, yeah. I said to her, I said, colonic irrigation, you know where you can stick that? But uh, after a while, you know, I started to get into it, you know, it's so surprising. Really. And now I go and have it done about four or five times a day, you know. In fact, my local place, my local colonic irrigation place, uh, it's two for one night, you know, and I've got a voucher, so I don't, you know, maybe like, after the year, after the show, you know me and you. Hey, Sherry, you fat son. Well, am I on? Hi, <laughs> right. How you diddling? <laughs> Bloody sad you then. All right, Bobby Sherry is here, top warm up man and comedian. Separated from me jag, sleeping in me pills, and me wife for me nibs. Okay, here we go. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what now. I ripped me trousers the other week, right? I took them to the invisible menders. Now I can't find the bleeding shop. Okay, Bobby Chariot, going very well, going very well, yes. So you what, I was having this meal the other week, right, in a restaurant, and then I did a runner. A bit stupid, really, because it was on a North Sea ferry. Tell you what, tell you what, you know, back in the 60s, I used to be in this band, right? I used to be in a band back in Liverpool. In this band, I knew all the big acts of the time, uh, the searches, Ikea and Tina Turner. John Lennon, yeah, I knew John Lennon. John Lennon thought of me as the brother he never wanted, yeah. But I fell out with John, right? I fell out with, all right, mate. I fell out with John Lennon when he wrote All You Need Is Love. Because I said to him, I said, no, John. I said, spoons, you need them. Ironing boards, John, you need them. Ironing boards so your trousers will be all wrinkled, you know. He said, who the bleeding hell are you? Could be very hateful, old John Lennon, yeah. I did this show the other week in a hotel. It was called the Forte Grand. I think it was called that, because that's what it cost for a drink in the bar, you know. But, eh, uh, when you have an expensive drink in one of them hotels, you do get complimentary snacks, don't you? Complimentary snacks. All the snacks are going, ew, we love you, Bobby. Ew, you're very smart, you are, Bobby. Okay, fantastic. I had a bit of difficulty getting here. There was a big map in the town centre I finally found and an arrow on it and it said, you are here. I thought, how the bleeding hell did they know that? Ha! <laughs> the other thing, guys, I was, a couple of weeks ago, I bought this bottle of beer, right? And it said on the bottle of beer, save very cold. And that's why I had no clothes on when they found me in the children's playground. God's sake. I had this business 
I used to have this business, which failed. Had this business. It was a face painting for the kiddies, you know, for the kiddies. It was a face painting business. Yeah. We used to do gloss or emulsion. All right, I'm out of here. I'm geography. All right, see ya. So here I am on the platform. I've got every rare CD that I've ever owned. Me cat, Tiger, the entire content of me designer wardrobe and me autographed photo of Jean-Claude Van Damme. I've got all this stuff with me because the guard says that when you leave the train, you have to ensure that you've got all your valuables with you. I'm getting a bit fed up of carrying all this clobber around. I think I might get the coach in future. <laughs> Such obsessive caution may seem ridiculous, but people in show business are naturally very, very cautious. For example, they will do almost anything to ensure that their careers go well. Like making a useful marriage, for example. Now, I'm sure all these people were like totally in love when they got married, but Mariah Carey was a little known pop singer until she married Tommy Mottola, head of the Sony Corporation. Sarah Brightman was a dancer in Hot Gossip until she married Andrew Lloyd Webber. And Anthea Turner was, well, Anthea Turner, until she married Peter Powell, head of one of the largest TV management companies in Britain. Therefore, I plan to marry somebody who I am very much in love with, but who I also do most of my work for. I'm talking about the Director General of the BBC, Mr John Burt. As my career goes stratospheric, I won't forget the little people, though. No, I'm going to use my position to benefit the entire public broadcast sector. Imagine the scene in our love nest on top of Broadcasting House, when John comes home from a hard day at work slashing budgets. To put him in a romantic mood, I'll have made him my famous sausage surprise. Then we'll settle down to watch a bit of television. 8 to 8.30, Alexi Enders. 9 to 10, Bally Kiss Alexi. 10 to 10.30, Alexi's behaving badly. And over on BBC Two, have I got Alexi's for you. TV signals don't just come into our homes. They also ricochet off the surface of the planet and travel across the distant voids of space to faraway planets where this program can, at least in theory, be watched. Of course, aliens don't pay their license fee, so you can insult them as much as you like. Oi, you lot on Barnard Star, you hydrogen-drinking asexuals. You've got too many eyes and your breath stinks of copper sulphate. Hmm? Now I'm in trouble. But the great thing about insulting aliens is, by the time they get the TV signals, they'll just about be in time to attack me grandchildren, which serves the little tykes right for borrowing money off me every bank holiday. Of course, it all depends on where the aliens are. Aliens on this planet here, reasonably close to the Earth, get the most recent stuff. They're really looking forward to the great programs they're gonna get when Channel 5 starts. On this distant star here, there's only the wooden tops and a bloke in a dinner jacket reading the weather forecast. Aliens on this planet talk to each other much more often and their children are much more respectful of authority. Now, on this planet here, the aliens are lucky enough to get the original transmissions of Hancock's Half Hour. Their view of the world is conditioned by brilliantly crafted, subtly characterised British sitcoms. Unfortunately, this is where the really scary aliens live. They must have come here for a reason. Let's try at least to make contact. Initiate the tonal sequence. Raised by 300 hertz. It's opening up, sir. It's some kind of speaker.
humans. And while we will be annihilated, at least we'll be annihilated by something with inherent quality. If these aliens had lived 10 light years closer, we would have been massacred by characters from on the buses, and that really would have been horrific. As I've got older, a lot of my friends have become desperate to have children, and they've resorted to these methods like using UVF. UVF. That's a Protestant terrorist group, isn't it? Yeah, Ian Paisley comes round to your house with a turkey baster full of sperm. Oh, I got the turkey baster full of sperm! I got the turkey baster full of sperm to make the orange children with the turkey baster full of sperm! I'm actually an only child. I don't know if you can tell that. Look at me, everybody, look at me on the telly, everybody. Look at me, do me little dance, everybody. Look at me, look at me, do me little dance. Ooh, ooh, ooh. But being an only child actually made me rather a greedy child. For example, I thought, right, if you get a shilling, 5p, off the tooth fairy, I thought, well, how much will you get off the liver leprechaun? Or, or the kidney goblin. So I was always wandering the streets with bits of me anatomy in me hand. At least that's the case for the defence. Bookshops these days seem to be full, mostly, of self-help books. These books are aimed at and bought by women. Men think that they're perfect already. And they have titles like uh, Women are from Mars, Men are down the pub, um, women who love men too much and women who've bought loads of self-help books but are still completely balmy. I'm going to start a new publishing trend though. I'm going to write a self-unhelp book. Yeah, I mean it follows, doesn't it? That if you need loads of sage advice to make your life a seat of tranquility, then you also need the help of an expert, me, to make a complete shambles out of your life. I think I'm going to call my book How to Completely Bollocks Up your own life. And here to whet your appetite are a few pre-publication tips. One, try and do all your drinking before 9 a.m. Two, live with your mum till you're 45. And three, do this on national television. 